welcome to our Sabbath night. We, um, it's been an, an eventful and long day for us, and so you are getting us on the tail end of things, but we're happy to make your acquaintance. We're happy to be in your homes, and again, we say welcome to our Sabbath night. Of course, to our conference callers, we always say hello to you, and of course, we ask you star six your phone. To our Facebook and YouTube users, once again, we welcome you, and uh, we ask that you continue to follow us via Facebook by liking us, but also, again, we ask that you would share us so that others will know um, about this ministry. YouTube, please subscribe to us and just hit that, that bell button, and Instagram, we just ask that you would give us your heart or put a heart up there. And so just a, a very few announcements. Um, to let you know of, Bible U is on this upcoming Wednesday. At, I mean, excuse me, Bible U is Monday, Monday, sorry, at 7 p.m., all right? Uh, reboot is on Wednesday, dealing with chapter 4 and 5 of Joshua. And then next Sabbath, um, I've decided we're just going to cancel service to, due to the fact of uh, Lester's funeral because of his 31 years here. There's a uh, memorial as a funeral service, and so we will cancel our service and, uh, and join that. We will give you the link if you want to join us, but uh, we will not have any online service next week. There's so many pieces involved in what's taking place throughout the city of Memphis, and so it would be impossible to, um, to be able to put a quality broadcast up. Um, and so... You hear more about his funeral service, April 10th, is the church opening. So please be aware that, um, and don't let the big guy in the picture scare you, but uh, we want you to be aware of the modification of things, and so you will hear more about that uh, coming up. There'll be a little video, and we'll talk more about it as the day gets closer. Looking forward to the snack today. Uh, I've missed you all dealing with the uh, Heaven's Ticking Stub. It's one of my favorite studies. And so we, we're going to get into it right after our health evangelist gives us our health moment. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for bringing us together. Uh, we ask that you will be with us in all ways and all things, helping us to hear your voice, know what you expect, and how to get there. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, now here's your health. <laughs> Good evening. Now, as promised from this morning, we said we would uh, talk about fiber. So we're just going to take a little detour. Now, the reason we want to talk about why do we really need to eat fiber? Now, fiber is best known for its ability to fight constipation, but the average person is not getting nearly enough fiber in their diet. Um, the USDA recommends 22 milligrams of fiber per day for women and 38 for men, but experts believe that the number should be more like 35 to 50 milligrams of fiber every day. Now, fiber can help you to feel full longer, support your weight loss efforts, reduce colon cancer risk, help prevent and address estrogen dominance and support mood and cognitive functioning. Now, fiber is most famous for keeping us regular. It does this by adding bulk to the stool, which gives the walls of the intestines something, to, something more to push against in peristalsis, which are the wave-like movements that move food along the GI tract. Now, chronic constipation is associated with vitamin D deficiency, as well as anxiety, depression, and reduced quality of life. 
but fiber doesn't just help to speed food along through the body. It also helps to capture it. Fiber has a mesh-like molecular structure, and it, as it moves along the GI tract, it traps unwanted particles along the way. Now, metabolic byproducts um, and hormones are the most important substances that fiber cleans up. Now, accumulated metabolic waste products are toxic to your cells. Likewise, if hormones don't leave the body after completing their initial task, they can cause problems too. For example, once estrogen triggers a menstrual cycle, the liver will prepare for it by elimination, I'm sorry, prepare it for elimination by pairing it with bile, which will whisk the used hormone towards the exit. But bile is a fat, and once it reaches the end of the small intestine, where the body absorbs the fatty acids, bile will get reabsorbed into the bloodstream unless there is a net of fiber to catch it and take it to its proper destination, which is the toilet. 95% of bile is reabsorbed if we're not eating enough fiber. And all of the hormones in the bile will go back into the bloodstream. Now, that wouldn't be such a problem if hormones would stop doing whatever they did once they finished that one time. But they will continue on. So PMS, endometriosis, uterine, uterine fibroids are all an overexpression of estrogen after it has passed through the GI barrier and come back into the body. But it doesn't just do this for, to estrogen, it will do it to any hormones. So fiber makes sure that those waste products leave the body for good. Now, fiber plays a critical role in modulating the uh, microbiome of the intestines. For example, gut flora um, transform fiber into short chain fatty acids, including a particularly powerful one called butyrate. The health benefits associated with optimal butyrate levels include protection against insulin resistance, obesity, lung inflammation, asthma, cancer cells, a lower risk of colorectal cancer and stroke, reduced gut inflammation and oxidative stress, improvements in leaky gut syndrome, and positive uh, impact on gene expression. So gut microbiome, my, sorry, gut microbes also transform fiber into GABA, um, which is gamma amniobutyric acid, the nu neurotransmitter that helps to regulate anxiety and boosts memory, mood, and cognition. Now, how do we become so fiber poor? Well, these low carb, high fat diets have eclipsed high fiber diets in recent years and precisely because they starve the bad micro, uh, microbiomes, but they also disturb the good gut flora as well. So this is why most experts will view diets like the ketogenic one as something that is temporary. Low fiber diets can effectively rebalance gut microbial ecosystem and erase symptoms in the short term, but they will cause more problems in the long term. So there are three types of fibers that we want to make sure that we are taking in. Um, one, insoluble fibers, and those absorb fluid and add bulk to the large intestine. So it makes stools larger and easier to pass. So your sources for insoluble fibers 
are whole grains, nuts, beans, seeds, root vegetables, and fruit with edible seeds like kiwi, grapes, raspberries, and raisins. You have soluble fibers, which collect bile molecules, metabolic waste products, hormones, and other chemicals so that they can be eliminated from the body. Your sources for those are beans, peas, flaxseed, apples, psyllium, avocado, and Brussels sprouts. And finally, the prebiotic fiber. This feeds the good bacteria in your GI tract to produce health-promoting compounds like butyrate. And your sources for prebiotic fiber are bananas, onions, garlic, dandelion greens, and chicory root. Now, the best sources of all fiber are vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and whole grains like quinoa and steel-cut oats. Gee, that sounds awfully familiar. Hmm, I think that's the diet that God gave us in the beginning. How about that? So, how do we know um, that we're getting enough fiber? It's kind of easy. The real test is how often you poop or don't. We should be having one to three bowel movements every single day. If you eat three meals a day, you should have three bowel movements a day. Another measure of fiber is the ease of elimination. If you need to take um, War and Peace with you to the restroom so that you can read it while you sit, you need a little more fiber. So your, your stool should look like long brown bananas that kind of float, and then they go away. They come out so easy. So you want, when you're taking a lot of fiber, you've got to take in a lot of water. So fiber supplements aren't the answer. Even though they won't hurt you, in the long run, they usually are just one type of fiber, and we need three. So all of this information is so that you will have all that you need. And we are going to wrap this up next week, at, or maybe not next week, but the week after. We're going to wrap this up. I'm going to go back to the diet and how to make all of this fit in, because this is for your health. All of this is for your health. Well, Sister Cheryl, I have regular bowel movements. What does that mean? Oh, didn't you say depend on how many bowel movements you have? I mean, you talked about it on screen. Oh, you're welcome. You know, you are a health doctor here, so, yeah, I'm a regular guy, sometimes two times a day. I eat a lot of fiber. That's that good vegan diet. Don't hate, don't hate everybody. Um, we're going to get started here. I am um, thankful. We had our memorial today, and I'm thankful for Sister Lisa Cook who initiated it and everybody who showed up, and it was so good to see everybody. And listen, y'all, we also got a glimpse of, of being able to have our outside church. So if you're on Facebook and you saw it, we are... Glad that you were there with us. Uh, once again, Lester has meant quite a deal to us here, especially the folks who have been here for a while. And, and so he has made an impression on so many people. So I'm trying to get my computer up. It's, uh, it's tripping right now. So Crawford, you may have to start me off because you have my, um, my program. Let's try it again. Let's pray while I'm trying to get this thing up. It was working a minute ago. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity. Be with us, Lord, as we talk, learn together in Christ's name. Amen. So we, we want to review 
what we've learned so far, and I'm going to try to do two things at once because I'm trying to get this up. I think I this this Wi-Fi I'm on. It's the wrong one. Um, let's try this one. So here's what we need to do. We need to, I need to get on this other Wi-Fi right quick. Jules, do me a favor. Take my, here, you need to do this. Take my, get on the, get on the second one. Excuse me, you all, get on the second one when you get close to the office. And then bring it back. All right, we're talking about Heaven's Ticket Stub. And we want to review what we've learned so far. Remember, the first ticket stub was love. And as that first ticket stub was love, uh, we want to review the reason why we're even talking about this. In Christ Object Lessons, page 67, uh, the, uh, she says this. She says, the object... The object of the Christian life is fruit bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be reproduced in others. So one of the things you must understand that our whole purpose of our existence is that we must be fruit. Look at me. We must also, uh, we must bear fruit, but we must, that fruit must be bared in others. And so we must understand that we're supposed to be a reproduction factory. Whereas the fruit that's in us, we will invest so that fruit, which is that character, can also be in others. All right? Christ Object Lessons, page 69, says this. Christ Object Lessons, page 69, says this. When the character of Christ has been perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come and, cl and claim them as his own. And so we must understand that what Christ is looking for is a character reproduction of him. When the character of Christ has been perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to reclaim them as his own. Now, that's key, and that's beneficial. And we must understand that we have to be individuals who are some individuals who who, I lost my train of thought, who replicate the character of Christ, all right? Why? Because our first one was love. Our first one was love. And love is the most challenging, as many of us know it, but it's the most challenging of all because the flesh dictates many times how we respond to love. And so we make love conditional. We make love in a way that uh, is based upon conditions more than anything else. And because we base it on conditions, we oftentimes find ourselves, we find ourselves struggling with it. And we look at it from a cockeyed point of view. And because we look at it from a cockeyed point of view, we really don't know how to love like we should. And so when we look at this word love defined, understand this. Let's look at the word love defined. Love defined is this. Love defined is this. It is a feeling of strong or constant affection for a person arising out of a kinship or personal ties, this also includes sexual desires in a romantic way. So we must understand that when you love someone, understand what that means, all right? Now, here's the biblical definition of love, the agape love, the agape love in the biblical sense. It is loving without condition. In other words, this extends to those who don't what? Love us back. It's loving without conditions, and because it's loving without conditions, we find ourselves uh, loving in a way that's not like God. And so we base things on conditions. We base things on circumstance. We base things on situations. We base things based upon how we feel compared to what God expects. 
So one of the things we have to understand is that I must learn how to love without putting conditions on it, without putting re restraints on it, without strings attached. Even if someone doesn't love me back, God expects me to love in the agape way. All right? So that's our, that's our review. That's what, we've been, that's what we've been dealing with. So our next one, our next stub is joy. Love, agape love, produces joy. Now, this is our second stub. There's a difference between happy and joy. There's a difference that most people don't understand. So, so guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to define it for you. All right? Happy defined is this. This is happy defined. All right? And, and it should be on your screen. Happy defined is this. All right? It simply is feeling, feelings of contentment and often predicated by circumstances and outcome. All right? Leave it up there for a moment. Feelings of contentment and it's often what? Predicated by what? Circumstances and outcome. So what does that mean? In other words, it means that my happiness tends to be dictated by what? The situation at hand. All right? Now, it's external depending on the situation. I'll say it again. It's external depending on the situation. And because it's external, that means it's based upon what's taking place. Now, the word happy is mentioned only 30 times in the Bible. It's only mentioned 30 times in the Bible. That's all that's mentioned is 30 times. No more than that. Happy is only mentioned 30 times. Now, joy, let's define joy. Let's define joy. Joy is a feeling of great pleasure no matter the circumstance or the outcome. All right? Let me say it again. Joy is a feeling of great pleasure no matter the circumstance or the outcome. All right? Now, joy is internal because of who I am and who I'm connected to. We must understand that. All right? Joy is external. Happiness is what? External. All right? Now, let's look at something. The word joy is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. Happy is mentioned how many times? 30. Joy is mentioned how many times? Over 300. All right? And because it's mentioned over 300 times in the Bible, it shows you that, that we need to be more what? Joyful than what? Happy. All right? So, so we have to understand that joy is more than happy. Now, I, I just got a message that we are buffering quite a bit. So here's what I want to tell you. We are recording. Is that right? We are recording. And because we are recording, you'll be able to go back to it. But, you know, listen. <laughs> Whenever we're talking about things of major importance, the enemy always messes with it. Just think about something here. My computer didn't want to come on. Now we're buffering real bad. Sister Cheryl spent time talking about the need to have a bowel movement. Right? And look at what we're going through now. And so we want you to pray for us because what we believe we're doing is an important ministry. That's why I'm asking those who have Facebook to share us. You know, share us. And I know we can do it because when we mentioned Lester's passing, we had 100 shares with 13, 14,000 views, all right? So I'm asking us to share it, to make the devil step back. But we're going to pray. Father, be with our system. It's buffering. We pray, Lord, that you will give us what's needed. Someone needs to be joyful today and not happy. In Christ's name, amen. I want you to think about something. Oftentimes, we spend more time talking about our need to be happy.
we, we tend to be more happy than what? Than joyful. And so what we need to understand is we need to be what? Joyful. But we spend so much time being happy and talking about being happy. And so we need things to make us happy. So we need the right relationships so we can be happy. We need the right income so we can be happy. We need the right type of church so we can be happy. We need the right type of employment so we can be happy. We need the right type of job so we can be, I mean, car so we can be happy. We need the right type of church so we can be happy. And the Bible only speaks about it 30 times. And so one of the things we have to understand is we cannot continue to just what? Be happy. So, so one of the things we have to understand is we have to learn to be what? Joyful. Joyful is what we have to learn to be. We need to learn to be joyful. Why? Because joyful, joyful is not based on circumstance. That's what it's not. It's not based on situations. Joyful is not. Happiness is. Joyful is who I am in Jesus. Happy is what society can make me if I'm not careful. And so we want you to understand that this particular ticket, this particular stub, this particular one does what? Helps me have a more better relationship with the Father because it has to be based upon my relationship with him. All right? So here are some biblical expectations of joy that brings joy. Nehemiah 8, verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The Bible says this, Nehemiah 8, verse 10. 8, verse 10 says this. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portion to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day, uh, I think I gave you, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. So, so as Nehemiah is telling them about not being weary, he's trying to explain that we need to what? Find joy in who? The Lord. Oftentimes, listen to me closely, we try to find joy in people. We try to find joy in, in things. We try to find joy in places. My joy comes from that of the Lord. It doesn't come from anyone else. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. The Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I have of thee, think towards thee, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. All right? So, so one of the things we have to understand is that God is the one who orchestrates this joy. James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. James 1, verse 2. James 1, verse 2. The Bible says this. James 1, verse 2. Bible says this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. So, so the Bible says that joy can come out of what? Trials. Oh, that's, that's too much to bear. <laughs> Trials tend to make us either angry. Trials tend to make us discouraged. Trial, trials tend to bring out the worst in us when the Bible says that it, we must learn that a trial should bring out my what? Best. It's supposed to produce joy. All right. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. In other words, he didn't say be happy about it. He says be what? Joyful. Right? Why? Because character revealed is revealed in a crisis. Right? That's what you must understand. Character is revealed in a crisis. Character is what? Formed day by day, but it's tested to see if you're joyful or not. 
All right. First Peter chapter four, verse 12 and 13 says this. First Peter chapter four, verse 12 and 13 says this. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Verse 13 says, verse 13 says, but rejoice to the extent that you have been a partaker of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So once again, we see what? It's a trial that helps with what? My joy campaign. Count it all joy. Why? God expects me to be in a joyful state no matter what the circumstance is. Why? Because joy is internal, it's not external. Joy is based upon who I am compared to what I'm trying to be. So in all of these situations, what do we see? We see joy, which is in everything that causes unhappiness, discouragement, and even doubt. The Bible says there is what? Joy. God expects in all of these situations... Because it's supposed to, why does he expect us to be joyful? The reason he expects us to be joyful is because we know that there's an expected end. We know that it is he who does what? Who's in total control of what's taking place. We must understand that. It is he who is in total control no matter what. All right. Hebrews 12, 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Bible says this. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we see what? That the Bible says that we need to look to Jesus who for the joy endured the cross. For the joy, the cross is nothing enduring. The cross is nothing happy. The cross brings pain in this circumstance. The cross is agonizing. The cross is challenging. The cross is horrific. But yet and still, the Bible says that Christ who for the joy endured the cross because he knew that if he made it through, we have a chance. He knew that if he made it through, there's salvation. He knew that if he made it through, there's eternal life. But because he has a relationship with the Father, he can look to it with joy. What's joyful about suffering? Nothing. The only thing joyful about this type of suffering is that we'll be saved by his death on the cross. So it brought Christ great pleasure rejoicing, knowing that we will taste salvation because of what he did. So the agony becomes less because joy overtook him. The agony becomes less because joy stepped in and said, I got you. The agony is not as much agony because joy says, I'm right here. Scriptures that bring joy. Psalms 46, verse 1. Psalms 46, verse 1. The Bible says, God is our, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Listen to me now. Bible, when I know that no matter what, that God is my refuge, right, that's my safe area. My strength gives me power, and he is a very present, it didn't say past, but a very present help. We must understand that I can't do anything on my own. We must understand that God has to be the one who provides my shelter. God has to be the one who provides for what I need. God has to be the one that takes care of my all-in-all, all, Pastor Crawford. When I know that God got me, then I, it 
I should be in a state of joy. Not happy because happiness is a temporary ex external situation. Joy is I'm all about. So even in the midst of what we go through with this death with Lester, we still can have some joy about us, not that we're joyful that he's gone, but that we can have some joy knowing that one day we'll sing a song and never get tired. Right, we'll be in the pearly uh, among the the golden gold, golden streets. Psalms thirty verse five. Psalms thirty verse five. The Bible says this. Psalms thirty verse five. Psalms thirty, verse five. And I want to read just that 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 last part that we always read. It says, "For his anger is but for a moment; his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but what? But joy." But what joy comes in the morning. Weeping endure for the night. What's in the night? There's all type of things in the night. There's all type of situations in the night. There's all type of circumstances in the night. There's all type of challenges in the night. So we have to understand that we need to what? We can weep now, but there'll be what? Joy later on. Right? Understand that. We cannot afford to do what? Weep all night long. Why? Because there be joy that comes. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 23 to 26 says this. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his right hand. I have been young and, and now I'm old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging for bread. When we look at this verse, we must understand that David is simply saying that no matter what time of life I've been in, that God has what? taking care of things, that God will take care of things, that God will continue to take care of things. We must understand that he is simply saying what? That God got you and he got those what? Behind us who are our what? Descendants. Who are who? Those that we need. To those that we need to not worry about. So please don't, un don't misunderstand. God is trying to set us up to be joyful. Romans 8 verse 31. Romans 8 31 says... What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, that's, that's power right there. That no matter what is taking place, God said, I got you. If God be for us, then who can be against us? So, 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 what we have to understand, joy says you can be joyful because God got your back. Joy says that no matter what situation you find yourself in, God got you. Joy says to, to you, to me, that weeping may endure for a night. It may last all night long. But, the, but this is going to take a turn. There'll be a turn that takes place. But joy comes in the morning. Joy says that trials are supposed to bring out the best in you, not the worst. Joy says that we need to count it all joy when we go through something. That's what joy says. Why does joy say that? It says that because joy says I can depend on God. That God is going to bring me what? Jeremiah 29, 11, a future and a hope is what it says. Now, let's look at some examples of, of joy being exhibited. Joy being exhibited. Let's look at some examples. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. 
and 13 says this. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, the Bible says this. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Verse 13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were, <laughs> excuse me, uneducated, untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with who? With Jesus. Now, understand this. These brothers had been beaten. These brothers had been targeted because they are preaching the gospel. Now, they're told in this same chapter to stop preaching the gospel. Now, look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Look what verse 16 says of that same chapter. Verse 16 says this. He says, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, they, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Verse 17 says, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak from now on they speak to no man in his name. Let us severely threaten them, verse 18 says. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19 says, But Peter and John answered said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God than to God you judge. For we cannot speak, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So so listen to me now. These are the same ones who were scary terries. These are the same ones who were scary cats. Now they have this boldness. See, joy gives you a boldness that the devil can't mess with you. Joy gives you a boldness that the devil can't touch you. Joy gives you a boldness that says, no matter what you bring my way, we're still going to do the same things we've been doing. Joy does that. Joy does that. That you can speak it even though you've been threatened. See, the Hebrew worthies had joy. They say, King, you can kill us, but check this out. You will know that we know how to serve you. So they went in there with joy on their hearts. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. And then we're going to look at 18 and 40. Peter's shadow having power. Acts 5, verse 15. The Bible says this. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. The Bible says this, so they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by may fall on some of them. So we know that the Bible showed that Peter's shadow had power. Verse 18 says this, 18 says this, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. So people were being healed and people were what? Being what? Brought back to life. And the, and the church leaders were threatened by this. But look at verse 40. Verse 40 says this. Acts chapter 15, verse 40 says this. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and what? Beating, beating them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. Now look at verse 41 and 42. The rest of it says this. 41 says this. Verse 41 says, so they departed from the presence of the council doing what? Rejoicing. They've been beaten, but they are what? Rejoicing. That they were counted worthy. Let's read the rest of that scripture. They were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Verse 42 says. And daily in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus the Christ. Hmm. Now, I want you to listen to some first lady. We live in a totally different paradigm shift. How many folk can honestly say they are joyful in Jesus? We got song. I remember a song. I don't know they don't do a while like they used to, but there was a song. Um, <laughs> I was about to sing it, but I had to catch myself. I done messed myself up now. But I have the joy of Jesus in my heart, right? All right? I know the devil hates me, but I got the joy of Jesus in my heart, right? Down in my heart. Way down in my heart, right? So, so I want you to understand something. Peter's shadow got power. 
It ain't, it's not Peter's fault he got power in his shadow. It's the Holy Ghost said, I'm going to give your shadow power. The folks see the influence of these apostles. The Bible says that they beat them. First of all, they severely threatened them. And now they're beating them. Acts chapter 4, severely threatened them. Acts chapter 5, they beat them. Not only did they beat them, but they told them, don't speak it no more. The Bible says, look at verse 41 again. 41 again. Let's put that back up there. For, look at verse 41. I want you to look at this thing. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy. Now, now, now bring me back. Rejoicing after being beaten. Rejoicing after being beaten. Rejoicing after being beaten. The trial produces joy. The situation would have said be discouraged. But because of their boldness, look at the boldness to have Jesus. Listen, if God be for me, who can be against me? God is my refuge and my strength. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Because I got these promises, it produces joy. And because it produces joy, I can face anything at any time. Don't let your trial be your downfall. Don't let your temptation be your downfall. Don't let, don't, don't let tribulations bring you down. But say, Lord, I need joyfulness in my soul. And you can't get there if you don't practice it. These brothers were beaten for the gospel's sake, and they still had joy. You look at verse 42. Verse 42 says this, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the what? Christ. Daily. They did not cease preaching and teaching Jesus because they were what? In a joyful state. The joy ticket stub. Listen to me closely. We're coming to an end shortly here. The joy ticket stub rejoices no matter the situation, circumstance, or outcome because the believer knows and believes in who is in full control. So even though it starts out weeping, joy is coming. The believer's state of being is not predicated by circumstances. See, many of your Situations is predicated by circumstances. So my job predicates my happiness, as I mentioned earlier. See, people, can't, people don't think they can be happy if they don't have somebody in their life. People don't think they can be happy if they don't have enough money or cars or clothes or stuff or popularity. But if I got joy, ain't no, there's nothing you can do to me that's going to bring me low. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't uh, suffer a little discouragement sometimes. But what it means is this. I must get back to my state of being joyful. God expects no less of this from us. So the question is, how do I get there? Here's the key. Philippians 3, verse 10. Philippians 3, verse 10. The Bible says this. Philippians 3, verse 10. Bible says this, Philippians 3, verse 10. These last four scriptures and we're done. Philippians 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. The key is, and, I, and listen, until, until I stop breathing, first lady, I'm telling you that I may know him. You can experience a resurrection if you don't know who Christ is, that I might know him. That means personally acquainted. That means knowing no matter what. The same thing when I contracted the, 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 the COVID, because I know my wife, I knew she's going to take care of me. Even that means that she had to risk her own safety to take care of me, right? Because I know her. If I was like, no, don't come in my, my secluded social distance room. She's going to find a way to come in there and take care of me because I know her. Right? If I need something done, I know she'll get it done. I don't have to worry about her. We have to have that same dependency on God. That, Lord, no matter what I'm going through, 
I know you, and you're going to make the best out of my worst situation. Listen to me, y'all. Because oftentimes we get fragmented, we get fragile because we look at what's before us and not the end. See, joy takes him to the end of it and says, no matter the outcome, I'm going to be joyful. Because it's better to be with it or not. God is going to decide and I'm going to be joyful. See, because when I know him, Pastor Crawford, then Philippians 4, 4, 6, and 7 takes me into this state. Listen, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, now come at me. Look at this. If I know him, which means I know he got me, which means if he's for me, nothing can be against me. That means in Isaiah 57, I believe, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Even though it's already formed, it's not going to prosper. It's not going to overtake me. So because of that, I can be what? Joyful about it because God has the what? Last say. And as long as God has the last say, I have nothing to worry about. So, so, so now Paul says, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? Rejoice. That means be in a permanent state of joy. Why? Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says this. Philippians 4 verse 6 says this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Verse 7 says, and the peace of God which passes, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So if I'm listening to me now, watch the connection, watch the bridge, how it comes together. If I know him, I'm going to rejoice always in the Lord, and anxieties can get to me. Because why? Why, why Jerry? Because I got peace that surpasses all understanding. And it's going to guard my heart and my mind. Understand that unless I have what? Unless I know him, I won't have what? Joy. If I don't have joy, then anxiety is going to come in. Because the next ticket stub is peace. If I'm not joyful, there's no peace. If I can't love, there's no joy that leads to what? Peace. See, they all jump into each other some way or another. But the reason we have anxieties, Lord, because we're not joyful. We don't, we don't think God can fix it. So I got to put my big foot in there and fix it. See, that's the problem you trying to fix your spouse. That's the problem you trying to fix your, your, your children. That's the problem you trying to fix your pastor. That's the problem you trying to fix church members. When God says, let me be in control, your, your responsibility is just to be joyful. Your responsibility is just to love unconditionally and let me do the rest. Just stay joyful. See, 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 the Bible says rejoice always with no anxieties because I know him. Experience the res- resurrection because the resurrection experience because of his sufferings. I'm able to have what? Peace. So how do I find joy in this experience? Two scriptures. One of my favorite two, Proverbs 23, 28. It simply says, son, give me your heart. 23, 28. Proverbs 23, 28. Somebody says, son, give me your heart. Proverbs. I think I put the, gave you the wrong one. He says, simply give me your heart. 2326, I'm sorry. 2326. He simply says, and I'll read it. He simply says this. My son, give me your heart. That's where it starts. My son... Give me your heart. It starts with us giving God our whole heart. The song we sung this morning, or they sung this morning, withholding nothing. We must give him our heart. Because Psalm 51, verse 7 through 10 says this. What does giving giving us his heart look like? The Bible says, purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 8 says, make me, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Verse 9, hide your face, 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 12 says this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Why don't we have joy? Because we, we are predicated by everything around us. David made the critical mistake. You may not call it a mistake, but see, because we don't understand the depths of sin, and David didn't realize what this thing would snowball into. David looked in his balcony, saw beautiful Bathsheba, and wanted to take a bath with Bathsheba. Killed her husband Uriah, got the girl pregnant, and David, Nathan pointed to him and, and, and told him how wrong he was. David repented, and he realized something was missing. And what was missing was the joy of Christ, of, of God in his life. That's why he says, purge me, clean me, hide your face from my sins. But, but the key is creating me. Remove the old, bring in the new. So that why, why? So that I may be restored to the joy of salvation. We don't have joy, y'all, because we don't know him. We don't have joy because we don't depend on him. We don't have joy because we, we haven't given him our whole heart. We don't have joy because anxiety fills us. We don't have joy because we don't believe in his promises. Listen, no circumstance should detour us from being joyful. I want to get there. I got to have joy in my heart. I got to have joy in my soul. I have to live joyful, knowing that God got me. That's your desire today. You want joy in your heart? You got to give your whole heart to Him. You got to give everything so that He can begin transforming you. So every trial, every tribulation, every situation is your opportunity to become joyful. But you got to know how to love first. You can't skip it. Lord, help me to love in an agape way. Then, Lord, help me to be joyful without conditions. See, if I can love without conditions, I can be joyful in any circumstance. Then I'm at peace. It's our next ticket stub. It's been, it's been punched. You got, you got to hold on to it to get there. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for bringing us together. We pray, Lord, that you help us in this fight to be joyful, not just happy. Help us, Heavenly Father, is my prayer. Holy Ghost, creating us a clean heart and renew a right spirit. Thank you, Lord, for helping us get through all the technical challenges. But, Lord, we're still joyful. We're still holding on. If someone has not, Lord, help them to surrender all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's Pastor Jackson signing off. We look forward to seeing you on Monday for Bible University, Tribe of Gad. God bless you. God keep you. And as always, remember, we are better together. And this church is a church motivated by mission for ministry. This church is a church motivated by mission for ministry. God's being.